This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Okay, so good morning. Yes, we're still morning. Morning, everyone. So today we're going to be looking at um, the second half of the traditional approach to requirements. Last week we looked at data flow diagrams. This week we're going to be looking at documenting the data flow diagram components. So basically providing um, more detail in terms of what happens within our data flow diagram what happens within a system and what happens within the various processing that occurs within the system, i.e. expanding the primary functional requirements of a system. Um, other thing we'll also be looking at is locations and communication through networks. So if we have geographically dispersed systems, how we can determine where the systems are and what functions are available in different um, geographic locations, where the data is stored, etc., etc. Reminder for this week, the assignment is due this week. It's due on when? Sunday. Sunday at 11. And if you submit late, you get zero unless you've had an approved extension request by me. Okay? Remember, please, only one person to submit on behalf of the group. Um, the groups are online. If the group is incorrect as to what I've got online, then you need to let me know urgently because that's how the marking will be done and that's how the marks will be allocated uh, for group members. Okay, so make sure only one person on behalf of the group submits because that group submission is actually copied across to all the other members in the group that I've set up in Learn Online and on the system. So it's really important that the groups are set up properly. I think that's it in terms of the website. So let's now have a look at the PowerPoint slides. So this week's topic um, is online chapter B. So it's not actually in the hard copy of the textbook, it's actually online and I did provide the link to the online chapters on the course website just above the slides for this week. So we need to think about process descriptions. Um, sometimes they're called process specifications or mini specs. So we're pretty basically just adding another level of detail in terms of what's going on in the processing within a particular system. Why? To reduce process ambiguity, to basically outline what's going on within a particular process and I guess to obtain a precise description of what is actually being done within a particular scenario. 
We want to be able to do it in different ways and there are different ways that we can document and analyse logic in terms of how things are done within processes in a system. Um, and three examples that we'll be looking at today are structured English, decision tables and decision trees. The three are quite different um, in terms of how they look but they all have a similar purpose and that's basically just to provide another level of detail and information about perhaps how decisions are made, um, how the processing is done, perhaps um, some rules that should be followed in terms of what needs to go on in a particular process or a particular scenario within a particular process. So the structured decision analysis methods, they do promote completeness, accuracy and communication because we are communicating either to the customer or to the designers of the system what specifically needs to go on and what rules may be factored into in terms of how you actually design a system for a particular process. So just to give an example, um, I'm using a couple of sources for today's lecture, um, in a, basically following on from last week where I used Kendall and Kendall to describe the data flow diagrams. I'm also referring to um, Kendall and Kendall as well as the current textbook um, chapter B to give you a bit more information about the um, traditional approach because Kendall and Kendall, the whole book is based on the traditional approach um, whereas ours is more the object oriented. So a little bit more detail. So you can see here we've got our process. Um, a process specification form may take the form of structured English um, up the top where we've got some basically some words really um, structured in a certain way using some conditions and some um, What's the word I'm thinking of? If then end if, if then end if, the words that are... Expressions? No, no. When you put them in capital letters, anyway, it'll come to me. Reserved words. Okay? With the, with the capitals, okay? So we're using some of those reserved words, um, and that's why they're in capitals. But we're using some various constructs, okay, to represent... Um, ways that you should, I guess, interact or work through a particular scenario. A decision table, again, slightly different, and I'll go through what a decision table looks like and how you construct a decision table. Decision tree, another approach and a different way of, I guess, visually representing the decision table. So in terms of structured English, it's basically um, writing specifications that combine structured programming with narrative English or narrative, depends how you pronounce it. Okay, so we're looking more about the structured English approach. Um, are, are any of you familiar with pseudocode? Okay, so you, you'll look at it and you'll think it looks quite similar also to pseudocode. So a combination of pseudocode and structured English. Benefits, um, it's pretty much using structured logic and simple English statements that the lay person or anyone can basically read and interpret and understand. Okay, it's not technical jargon, it's not technical language, it's not highly sophisticated um, Java programming or not specific to a programming language. It's using common English words but providing it in um, a structured way that allows you to look at logic or formulas or decisions that are not complex and how you would phrase those decisions and take action based on various decisions that need to be considered. So we basically express all the logic in terms of um, sequential structures, um, using again some decision structures, using case structures, using iterations, um, keywords, that was the word, keywords. Um, using capitalised accepted keywords such as if, then, else, do, perform, have them in capitals, similar to what you'd probably do with pseudocode, um, I'm assuming. Indenting blocks, so if we have an if then else, uh, we've got indentation occurring, so it's easy for you as the, I guess, the developer of the structured English or the person who's reading the structured English to see the flow of the information. And when you've got a block and you've got it indented, what information goes with what part of that block? Um, you can also underline words or phrases that have been defined in a data dictionary. And it's really just to clarify the logic of a particular scenario and what actions need to be performed based on a given scenario. So here's some examples of structured English types. The first one is pretty much a, sequ a sequential structure with a block of instructions uh, with no branching. So we pretty much just do three simple actions. Okay. The next one is a decision structure where we show um, and if a condition is true we complete a simple action, otherwise we complete another action and then jump to the end if. 
Okay, so we've got if condition A is true, then implement action A, else implement action B, end if. The next one is a case structure where we have certain scenarios that might be true depending on certain cases. So this is the case structure scenario um, where the cases are mutually exclusive. Okay, so it's only one can occur, not another one. An iteration, again, we've got the do while um, a certain condition is true. In this case, it's do while there are customers um, and we uh, carry out a specific action number one. And there could be multiple actions within that do while. So these are just some examples of the different types of structured English types that we can see when representing the logic behind a particular scenario. Here's another example. Um, this one's actually in the textbook. So you can see we've got a whole block here or a procedure. Okay, again, talking about some programming language stuff here with pseudocode, structured English, keywords, procedures. This is a procedure to process ballots. So we've just got some straight um, actions, collect all ballots, place all ballots, set yes count and no count to zero. So we're just doing a few preliminary actions. Then we've got a repeat and an end repeat occurring here. So we've got some sort of looping happening, which is why the indentation occurs. Then we've got an if, else, end if scenario, again represented by end if, uh, by indentation to show what happens in the if clause. Um, again, indenting to show what happens in the else clause. Once we've re completed that end if, then we've got another action being carried out. Then we have the end repeat. Then we've got another if, else, end if. Then we've got a, another action. Then we've got the end of the process. Okay, so either a sequence of steps either um, some sort of looping, either some sort of if condition. And you can see, just by visually looking at it, because you've got the indentation, it's quite clear where your sequential processing occurs, where you've got your conditions, where you've got your looping, where you've got your repeats. So the indentation is really important when we're looking at structured English. Um, again, these particular authors don't have the keywords in capital letters. Okay, it's not a must but it's something that can or cannot be done. So I wanted to show you that there, were, there are slight different variations in terms of how you might see this represented depending on, on the author of the work. Okay, but in terms of the indentation, that's pretty consistent throughout. Here is a, another structured English example. So for this particular process, right, we've got a process of customer, uh, record customer information, which is process 2.1. We've got a customer external entity, which is providing new order details. We've got a customer data store with an unlabeled data store, which we don't know what it is at the moment, but it should be. And we've got order details coming out from record customer information. So what this piece of structured English is actually representing now is what actually happens when we record customer information. So the verbal representation of what goes on in this particular process. Okay, why? So you can clarify if the processing that it's occurring is correct when you're gathering your functional requirements from your user or your eliciting requirements. Once that confirmation is complete, then you can pass on that information to those that are developing and designing the system to make sure that you've actually interpreted and understood what needs to be going on in record customer information. Now, I've given you this process here I've given you this record customer information scenario here. We've just done a, a number of weeks of the object-oriented approach. Can you, can you think back and tell me if we we're doing this in the object-oriented approach, where we would represent this kind of level of detail? Can you think of what it relates to in terms of the object-oriented approach? where we provide this kind of wording and detail in a scenario. What model would we have done in the object-oriented approach or could we do to give more information about what goes on in a particular scenario? Description. Which description? There are a couple of descriptions. Where do we provide more of a verbal, a, a written description at a, fine, at a high level of detail of what goes on in the object-oriented approach? 
description. You've got the use case description, which I think is what you're referring to. Then we take that further, because the use case description might be a low level use case description. What do you do to extend that even further? You provide a, a fully developed use case description. Okay, so you've got two areas that we need to consider. You can have your, your brief use case description, which gives you a bit of a summary of what goes on for a particular process. Then you can have your fully developed use case description, which gives you the table that I gave you with all the columns on the left, and then you can have your um, specific information about the flow of activities, okay, which can give you a bit more processing information about what goes on for a particular use case. So I just want you to see that there are different ways and different methods that can be used. The object-oriented way, the object-oriented way could be your use case description and your fully developed description. With a traditional approach, we can have our data flow diagrams and our processing, and we can have one of the things to show is our structured English approach. And again, just another example here to, desert, to determine delivery charges. Um, advantages, just a few advantages, pretty self-explanatory. We want to clarify the logic, and we want to represent it in an in a easily understood language, okay, with narrative English. And it can be taught to and understood by users in the organisation. Okay, so the users are what provide the primary functional requirements. So it can be easily understood by them to determine whether they've actually understood what needs to go on or whether they've conveyed the information to you in an appropriate fashion. That's structured English. Uh, the next thing we could do to present logic or decisions or rules about what happens in a given process is through a decision table. What's a decision table? It's pretty much a tabular representation. So no words, not a lot of words going on here, but it's more of a table um, of processing logic. What's in that table? We've got decision variables, we've got values, um, and we've got actions, okay? We have our table of rows and columns, um, and it's always separated, or typically separated, into four quadrants, okay? The four quadrants are our conditions, our condition alternatives, what actions need to be taken based on those conditions, and the rules for executing the actions. So we've got a bunch of conditions, um, how many alternatives we can have for those conditions, what are the actions that we perform based on those conditions, and which basically rules get fired based on which um, conditions get satisfied. And I'll show you about that in a little bit more detail now. So we've got our conditions and actions. Conditions, top left, actions underneath. Our rules, we have the condition alternatives, and we have the action entries. Let's have a look at that um, in terms of an example. This decision table example shows you, um, it's basically deciding which catalogue to send to customers who order only from selected catalogues. Okay, so. We've got some logic and decisions that need to be considered here in order to determine when we send a catalog out to customers. So the three conditions are, if the customer ordered from the full catalog, if the customer ordered from the Christmas catalog, if the customer ordered from the specialty catalog. They're the three conditions that we need to think about in this particular scenario in order to determine whether we send out this year's Christmas catalog whether we send out a specialty catalogue, whether we send out both catalogues. So these are the conditions, these are the actions. We now need to come up with a combination of rules and scenarios that will tell us when we need to carry out these particular actions. And there are ways that you can determine what these particular rules are. Depending on the number of conditions will determine the number of rules, and I'll talk about that in a moment. You can have yes, no values here, and there's, a, I guess, a, a process to follow in terms of how you fill these out, and we'll look at those decisions and those steps in a minute. So what do we need to do? First, you need to figure out what are the conditions that affect the decision, top left quadrant. Then you need to determine the possible actions that can be determined, that can be taken, bottom left quadrant. Then you need to determine the condition alternatives for each condition. Yes or a no are the condition alternatives. 
Is it Christmas? Yes. Is it summer? No, etc., etc. So yes and no are the condition alternatives. Then you calculate the maximum number of columns in the decision table. So there is a formula that you can use to determine whether you have eight columns of yeses and noes, or 16 columns of yeses and noes, or 32 columns of yeses and noes, or four columns of yeses and noes. Those column amounts are determined or dependent on the number of conditions that you have. Once you've given the maximum number of columns, then you need to fill in the condition alternative. So fill in your yeses and your noes for each of those particular conditions. Then you'd fill in the bottom right hand corner or quadrant of the table by inserting an X where the rules suggest action. So if these three rules need to be yes, that's when we carry out this particular action. Or if these two rules need to be yes and these one needs to be no, that's when we carry out this particular action. So you're pretty much following down the column and determining the combination of your yeses and noes and if that combination provides you with an action which is represented with the X on that particular action. Now this is where we're going to stop our development in this particular case, okay, in the course for developing decision tables. You can go further with the following steps where you can combine rules, where you can check for impossible situations, where you can rearrange it to make it more understandable and you can have something called a condensed decision table. We're not going to go to that level of detail. If you were doing a whole course on the traditional approach to modelling requirements, I would have probably gone through this particular um, information to show you how to come up with a condensed decision table. But for the purposes of what we're looking at, I just want you to understand and appreciate what a decision table is. You've got your four quadrants and how you come up with the information in terms of what needs to go in those four quadrants. So let's look at each step individually and how it relates to the example that I gave you. Determine the conditions that affect the decision. The number of conditions becomes the number of rows in the top half of the decision table. So these are our three conditions. Customer ordered from full catalogue, customer ordered from Christmas catalogue, customer ordered from specialty catalogue. Step two, determine the possible actions that can be taken. That number becomes the number of rows in the lower half of the decision table, in the bottom left-hand quadrant. Send out this year's Christmas catalogue, send out specialty catalogue, send out both catalogues. So there are all possible actions. These are things that need to be done as a result of this processing. Step three, we want to determine condition alternatives for each condition. So in the simplest form, our decision alternatives are yes or no. Okay, that's the answer to those particular decisions. And you make sure that all possible values for the condition are included. Again, you may have a range of decision alternatives. Other scenarios might not just have a yes or a no alternative. It could be a particular phrase or a word that is part of the decision alternative. It could be yes or no or maybe. Okay, so there are different alternatives. I'm giving you the simplest example with yes or no being a particular answer to those particular conditions. Step four is where we calculate the maximum number of columns in the decision table. So how many columns do we need to have in the top right hand quadrant based on the conditions? The way you work that out is you look at the number of um, alternatives, which is two alternatives in this case, yes and no, and the number of conditions that you have three in this scenario. So the alternatives is yes, no, which is two. The conditions is three, because we had three conditions or three questions being asked. And it's the alternatives to the power of conditions. So two alternatives to the power of three, which is eight. That gives you eight rules. If you had four conditions and two alternatives being yes or no for each of the conditions, there would be 16 possibilities or 16 columns and we would therefore have two to the power of four. Okay, so it's the alternatives, yes or no, two. The number of conditions, that's the power that you raise it to, and that gives you the number of rules that you need to have in your decision table. So that's a good place to think about and start for populating. What are your conditions? What are your actions? What are the alternatives, yes or no? Alternatives to the power of conditions gives you the number of columns that you need to have for your rules. Eight in this example because we've got three conditions. 
Then you fill in the condition alternatives. A way of filling out the condition alternatives is listed there, but in short, it's, it's, a, it's a quick method. What you basically do is you have, um, you halve it, the top row, top row, you put four Y's and four no's, then you halve that again, then you have two Y's and two no's, two Y's and two no's, then you halve that again, then you have a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So it's a pattern, okay? And it's always going to be the same. If you have eight columns, always follow this approach. If you had 16 columns, then you'd have eight Y's and eight no's, then four Y's and four no's, and you just keep going down, okay, and halving it each time you go down. So it's, it's a bit of a, a rule that you should follow in populating um, the, the columns for each of those conditions. Then you complete the table by inserting an X where the rules suggest actions. So look at these particular, the way you read this is you read down, okay? So we've got a yes, yes, yes for this condition, which catalogue should we then send out? We've got a yes, no, no for this condition, which catalogue should we then send out? We've got a no, yes, no for this particular scenario, which catalogue should we send out? We've got three no's here, which catalogue should we send out? Or should we send out a catalogue at all? Okay, so some of these, oh, these are all related to the combination of the rows here. Okay, so the decision table example recap. This is basically what I just went through. Okay, the decision table. That was a scenario that I gave you at the beginning. I just talked about all the steps. Again, deciding which catalogue to send to the customers who only order from selected catalogues. So what we've got here... <coughs> just to send out, yes, this year and send out specialty catalogue and across them, both of them, just instead of having to send out both catalogues. Say that again. If you have crosses in both the send out this year's catalogue and send out a special catalogue where you've got send out both catalogues, if you had X in both of them and you didn't have the bottom line, it would be the same thing. You could. I haven't looked at the scenario closely to determine if that's the case um, because it's only when you've got three Ys or you've got three Ys and they ordered the Christmas and the specialty is when you send out both. Um, but you probably could, yes, you're right, you probably could get rid of the bottom action, which is send out both catalogues and have um, an X, two Xs to send out there and there, yeah. So it depends how you set the scenario up. But yeah, what you're saying is definitely valid most definitely valid. In this case, they've just chosen to separate it. So we've got three different scenarios um, based on certain conditions. But you can see here, we've got our conditions, we've got our actions, we've got our eight rules, okay, which is yes and no, two to the power of eight. You've got your Y's, your N's, Y, Y, N, N, Y, N, Y, N. And based on what goes down each of these rules, what scenarios are satisfied will determine what happens here. And you'll basically work this from a scenario. So you're probably given a scenario, um, and we'll look at this in next week's tutorial, um, you'll be given a scenario with some written language, a paragraph maybe, and you'll be asked to convert that into a decision table. Okay, so that's pretty much how you would come about devising a decision table. You elicit some requirements from a user and they would tell you this is what happens and these are the conditions upon what, you know, how we determine, for example, when we send out catalogues. So you'd write all that down if you're having an interview or a group interview or a, a questionnaire, you'd gather all your information and then to visually represent that as a decision tree, um, that's the process you would follow. Okay, determine your conditions, your actions, your rules, and then which of those are fired depending on um, what the criteria are satisfied. So that's a decision table example. Again, advantages, um, it's just a different way of representing information. It shows you the logic of what happens, shows your conditions and your actions and, and upon which um, thought processes and which 
scenarios, you need to carry out those particular conditions. You can check for contradictions, you can check for redundancy, and you can check for perhaps any processing in, in, in errors that may have occurred if the scenario has already been developed and you've got things that are being sent out and they shouldn't be sent out. You could perhaps create a decision tree to represent that scenario and say, look, where are we going wrong? What have we misunderstood here? And that could be another way of checking for errors. Last thing is a decision tree. Okay, so we've looked at um, structured English, decision tables, now we've got a decision tree. Similar to a decision table, but it's just represented in a different way, where we have a graphical description um, of logic, and it pretty much looks like the branches of a tree. Okay? How do we draw decision trees? You pretty much look at all the conditions and the actions. Um, order and timing are critical in decision trees. Okay, so it shows you the order of things that need to be done. And you basically begin building the tree from left to right. So you start with a particular node and then you expand it. Then you look at the other nodes and you expand those nodes and, and follow a particular path depending on the condition that is represented by the, by the tree structure. So to give an example here of calculating shipping charges, you could have done a decision table. This is another way of representing it with a decision tree, which sometimes can provide or promote clarity in terms of understanding or seeing at a glance which path actually gets followed. Whereas with a decision table, it might be a little bit more complex to see and, and analyse where those Ys and Ns are and where the Xs actually fit. So we can see this is quite clear which path you follow and what the outcome is based on the path that you follow. So here we've basically got it into, into four sections um, where we pose the question, are the year-to-date purchases greater than $250? If yes, follow this path. If no, follow this path. The next thing that we need to ask, what is the number of items purchased? If it's less than or equal to three, we follow this path. If it's greater than or equal to four, we follow this path. And similarly, um, down here. Delivery day. What is the delivery day scenario? Is it the next day? Is it the second day? Is it the seventh day? If it's the next day, the delivery charge is $25. If it's on the second day, it's $10. If it's on the seventh day, it's N times $1.50. So the number of days times $1.50. I don't know, it's not, it's, it probably should have said greater than two, it, it, it should have said greater than two days, or within seven days. It's, the wording here is not quite complete because you're missing out day three to six. <laughs> um, day eight onwards. Well, and, yeah, day eight onwards. So in terms of how they've represented the path in this, in this final scenario here, uh, I'm not quite happy with that because that should probably say um, greater than three. Yeah, exactly. Um, but again, you can see straight away how ambiguity can creep into a scenario if you haven't represented it properly. Okay? So as far as I can see from this scenario, your delivery can either occur on the next day, the second day, or the seventh day. That's what that scenario says. Although it's a little bit deceiving again because you've got your N times 150. What does N represent? And this only says the seventh. Okay, so again, some ambiguity has crept into this particular scenario, um, as we can see. Here's another example uh, for non-cash purchase approval actions for a department store, um, a decision tree example. So if the purchase is under $50, um, you can pay via check or credit card. If it's greater than or equal to $50, you can pay via check or credit card. Um, and it just basically shows you what needs to occur depending on the amount spent and the way that someone has paid, what needs to be done. So if they've spent less than $50 and they're paying by credit card, you complete the sale with no signature required. If it's over $50 and they're paying with a credit card, you communicate electronically with the bank for credit card authorization. Okay? What's that scenario similar to? The pay wave scenario that we have. So if you spend less than $100, you just complete the sale and you don't have to sign. Okay, so... Sorry? If it's less than $100, you don't sign. If it's more than $100, you still... Oh, sometimes you do. Depends. Yeah, it could be just a pin. Yeah, I'll pin. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, 
Yeah, you enter your pin. I'm going back to the old days where you had to sign. But yeah, you're right. Sorry, yeah. You're right. So if it's over 100, you have to put your pin in. If it's under 100, you just swipe it and it all magically happens. So yeah. <laughs> so that's that scenario. So you can see quite clearly from a decision tree how you can represent the logic and the processing that occurs for various scenarios. Um, and again, helps you as a systems analyst understand the requirements of the system and, and to help you ensure that you've actually got the logic right of what happens for a scenario. Um, and again, you know, having a simple misunderstanding such as a signature or pin or no pin can have severe consequences on how the system actually is developed or how it actually works. So it's really important to clarify this with your users. Make sure that you've understood the requirements and that they've understood what they've given you so you can pass that information on when the system needs to be designed. Um, advantages of decision trees, the order and checking conditions. Are, um, you can see the order immediately in a decision tree. You can see the actions. You can see the results that um, what needs to be carried out based on the conditions that have been satisfied. So a different level of clarity provided by decision trees. Okay? Um, compared to decision tables, decision trees are more readily understood by others in the organisation. And I think it's quite intuitive to see with a de decision tree you can see and follow a path, whereas with a decision table it can be a little bit more complex and convoluted to try and figure out which yeses and noes lead to an X in that particular column. But again, it's different ways of presenting similar types of information and scenarios. So just some methods or reasoning in terms of why you select a particular scenario or why you select a, te a particular technique, whether you structured English, decision tables or decision trees. Um, depends who you're communicating with, depends who the audience is. Depends who is the recipient of that information. You don't necessarily have to create all three for every single scenario. Just like with the object-oriented approach, you don't have to create every single model for every single use case. You don't have to create an extended use case description for every use case. Okay, so again, it's tailoring, it's being flexible, it's understanding your audience and understanding and realising as an analyst which models are going to convey or represent the system requirements in the most effective and efficient manner, both for you as an analyst, for the customer or the stakeholders, as well as for the designers. Other things that can be shown um, using um, the traditional approach to requirements is data flow definitions. So this week you're looking at data flow diagrams um, and the context diagram where we've got our, our system being represented by a central process, we've got external entities, we've got flows coming in and flows coming out. What we can do is also provide data flow definitions. So what does a data flow consist of, for example? Um, and it's pretty much a textual description of the data flow's content and internal structure. For example, a new order could consist of a customer name, address, credit card info, item number and a quantity. You can also use algebraic notation to indicate the elements and the structure of that data flow. Um, and you may have seen this in your database course. If you're doing um, this in your database course, you may, may not have, I'm not sure. Um, but again, we're showing that a new order consists of a customer name, an address, a credit card information, plus a repeating for the number of items that you've got, the item number and the quantity. So you can consist of multiple. This one here? I think it's an N and a, it's definitely an N and I think it's a one. I'm not sure if it's a one or not, but it's pretty much repeat it for the number of items that you have. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it's a one. Or an I? Oh, it could be I. I, I yeah, I yeah. <coughs> um, again, another example for RMO products and items. Um, noted the nesting repeating groups like a typical control break report. So yeah. products and items report equals, um, you've got your ID, you've got your size. So it shows you here in algebraic form what actually goes or what elements make up that particular piece of information. 
Other things to be cognizant on and aware of is we have um, things called a data dictionary in a traditional approach to modelling requirements. In a data dictionary, the things that we can have, um, well, pretty much the data dictionary is a repository of where we store all our information. Okay, where we have our data flows, our data elements, and our data stores. And a data dictionary basically specifies what data stores we have, what data flows we have in our data stores, uh, and what data elements we have, and what are those data elements made up of. Okay? Um, so our data element definitions, we could have such things as a data type being string, integer, float, print or boolean. Okay, really important for programming purposes to know what the type of the element is. Um, and here's an example here of some data element definitions. So we have units in stock is a positive integer, a description is a text field, a unit price is a positive real number, supplier, four digit numeric code, Etc. Etc. Okay, so we're actually specifying what the data element is and defining the type of that data element. Again, moving into the programming realm of things now, but it needs to be specified. So just as a recap, okay, traditional approach to modelling requirements, we've got our data flow diagrams, we've got our process definitions, where we can, I guess, provide a, another level of detail in terms of what actually happens when we carry out the processes in our data flow diagrams, because data flow diagrams show the processes involved in a system. Um, we have our entity relationship diagrams, okay? The traditional approach, they call them entity relationship diagrams, the object-oriented approach. We have our domain model class diagram. Very similar, just different approaches. And our data definitions can tell us I guess um, a lot more information about what goes on within our entity relationship diagrams. What are our entities? What are the data elements? What are the types of those data elements? And how is the information structured within the entity relationship diagram? And all of these basically um, make up the components of the traditional approach to modelling requirements, as opposed to the object-oriented approach to modelling requirements. And just to finish off, um, before we get to cut off, locations and communication through networks. So pretty much there are different ways you can show um, processing locations of a system or um, locations in which processes are actually carried out or um, a table that shows where data entities and locations from which they are accessed are carried out for a system. Um, the CRUD we've already talked about. So it's giving you just, I guess, another view or another layer if you have a geographically dispersed system to provide a representation and an understanding of where is that system being used, where is it located, what is actually being used, which aspects of the system need to be up and running in certain areas of where that system is being, I guess, delivered or being used. So we can see here that we've got manufacturing in the warehouse in Portland, uh, we've got the data centre in Park City, uh, again we've got manufacturing here. So he can, we can see here the RMO location diagram of what, I guess, um, business units exist for RMO and where they are actually housed in this particular part of the United States. Activity location matrix shows us what activities are carried out, i.e. the primary functional requirements and where the location is of those activities that need to be carried out. And finally, the RMO activity data matrix, what activities are carried out and which data stores are actually being used and in what form with our CRUD matrix to determine how we're using the entities and which functions are being used by those particular entities. Okay, that's it for today. See you all next week. Good luck with your assignment. If you've got any questions, please post them on the appropriate assignment discussion forum which I'm monitoring and responding to. Bye.